Does Bruce Willis's career get the credit it deserves? Or has his action hero status long led many to write off his impact as an actor? In the 2021 Razzie Awards, a new category was introduced specifically to mock the number of bad movies Willis had been in just that year. But it was rescinded after the sad news of Willis's aphasia diagnosis and retirement from acting. Aphasia is when you have trouble communicating with another person. You're not able to communicate your thoughts. And since, there has been a mass revisiting of the roles that made Bruce so iconic. Who's chopper is this? <sighs> Zed. Who's Zed? <sighs> Zed's dead, baby. What's so interesting in looking back at Bruce's career is how the kind of action films that launched his cinematic stardom aren't made as much anymore. With a few key exceptions, that kind of spectacle has largely been swallowed up by superhero movies. Yet the irony of this new wave of action movies is while the characters are literally superhuman, the focus on narrative and relationships often makes them more down to earth compared to the impenetrable, invulnerable, hard-bodied action heroes of the 80s. I'll be back. And in fact, Willis acted as a bridge between these two eras, as much a part of the classic Hollywood action movie as Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger, but with a relatability and human quality that paved the way for more sensitive action leads like Chris Evans and even Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I know you're hurting, brother, but you don't want to do this. The recognizable everyman quality Bruce exhibits arguably has its roots in the role that made him famous. Private investigator David Addison in the TV series Moonlighting. Show creator Glenn Gordon Karen said of Bruce's casting, most of the men on television I didn't relate to. They just weren't men that I'd encountered in my life. Bruce walked in and I instantly felt like, oh, that's a guy from around the block. We're moving. Do we have to? All my friends go to this school. Here's our take on Bruce Willis, why he's more than an action hero, and how he became a new kind of movie star and one of the most influential actors of his era. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. We have a brand new episode of The Takeaway on the Prime Video YouTube channel, and it's all about The Wilds. The Wilds season two is out on May 6th. We are getting ready by digging into all of the mysteries and unanswered questions of season one. Looking at the season two trailer, it definitely teases out that we're going to find out more. I think there are gonna be some surprises. So check out our latest episode of The Takeaway on the Prime Video YouTube channel. It is impossible to divorce the 80s Hollywood action movie from the 80s American political climate. And the fact that Ronald Reagan, a former Hollywood cowboy himself, was now in the White House. Bruce Willis's status as an action hero is both a part of that climate and a bridge from the so-called new right to the more traditional conservatism of the Bush era. So your lady sees you, you run into each other's arms, the music comes up and you live happily ever after, right? I can live with that. After defeat in Vietnam and the depiction of Jimmy Carter as weak, Reagan was viewed as the epitome of strength and masculinity, bolstered by his survival of an assassination attempt. We're reminded of the many traditions of openness and democracy that have marked the history of this city. Amir missed me. Mm. <laughs> Susan Jeffords writes, the Reagan era was an era of bodies, from the profitable craze in aerobics and exercise to the molding of a former Mr. Universe into the biggest box office draw of the decade. But beyond the bodies of action heroes like Schwarzenegger, Stallone, and Jean-Claude Van Damme being reflective of a new American conservatism that sought to appear powerful and invulnerable, these characters were also, like Reagan at the start of the decade, outsiders who presented a challenge or threat to the establishment. If you want some friendly advice, a haircut and take a bath. You wouldn't get hassled so much. In Die Hard, John McClane's outsider status is apparent from the very start by virtue of the fact that he's a New Yorker who's landed in LA to patch things up with his wife. I'm a New York cop. A six month backlog in New York scumbags I'm still trying to put behind bars. At the same time, Die Hard, coming at the end of the decade and at the end of Reaganism, is not so much a contemporary of other 80s action movies, but a consequence of them. The film is knowingly self referential, engaging with iconic figures of masculinity in American society. Another orphan of a bankrupt culture, this is John Wayne, Rambo, Marshall Dillon. I was always kind of partial to Roy Rogers, actually. And the plot centers on a dislocated family trying to build bridges, characterizing McLean as a loving father willing to put his life on the line for the sake of that family. So it almost acts as a kind of male fantasy for the average American. The strength of the family was obviously a central tenet of American conservatism. And here, it takes more primacy than in the decade's earlier action movies. That was my wife, Ollie, Ollie Gennaro. 
Holly McClain. This theme continues as the Die Hard franchise goes on, developing a moonlighting-esque on-again, off-again theme between McClain and his wife over the next two films, before he saves his estranged daughter in Live Free or Die Hard, and then eventually teams up with his estranged son in A Good Day to Die Hard. You know, you're a world-class screw-up, you know that, John? I'm still your father. Yeah, nothing I can do about that. The fact that these other family members are initially antagonists to Willis before eventually being won round by his strength and masculinity again takes on a political component. The conservative-liberal divide is often viewed as a generational one, and this antagonism reflects that. In Armageddon, Willis's Harry Stamper is in a similar protective father mode. His first action of the movie is literally shooting at Ben Affleck's AJ, who's in a relationship with Harry's daughter. Prior to that, it's clear Harry's relationship with his daughter is similarly estranged. Hi, Harry. I have asked you repeatedly to call me dad. Sorry, Harry. But again, through epitomizing this everyman American strength and outsider status, Willis is able to save not only his family, but this time the entire world by cutting through a world of bureaucrats and ineffective experts and sacrificing himself for the greater good. By eventually reconciling with AJ, he effectively passes the baton over to the next generation's responsible family man. And given Ben Affleck's career was also moving into this action hero direction with Reindeer Games and Pearl Harbor, this passing of the baton almost felt like a meta-narrative, with the elder statesman giving his blessing to the new star. Always thought of you as a son. Always. I'd be damn proud to have you marry Grace. What made those early action heroes of the 80s feel like outsiders was to some extent their nationality. Schwarzenegger was born in Austria and Van Damme in Belgium. While Bruce was born in West Germany to an American soldier and German-born mother, he's always coded as all-American. His outsider status is more rooted in class. We wanted to make a film about ordinary people, about uh, people you can, you know, uh, relate to. He said he comes from a long line of blue collar people and his action heroes were refreshing for their very ordinary working class lives as laborers or police officers. Even in the futuristic sci-fi world of the fifth element, Willis's Corbin Dallas retains this everyman quality. I drive a cab now. Not a space fighter. This is crucial to his appeal. The more human he is, and maybe the more American he is, the higher the stakes and so the more we invest in him and will him to succeed. Bruce Willis's non-action hero roles are often seen as him playing against type, but this sensitive, funny, or romantic side of Willis is as much a part of his history as his action hero persona. In his breakthrough role David Addison in Moonlighting, Willis was the wisecracking romantic lead, closer to a Bill Murray than a Chuck Norris. Let's see a little confidence, a little charisma, a little Dale Carnegie. Remember, lesson one, imagine your entire audience is completely naked. He was like... Second generation Bill Murray. While Moonlighting may have only run for 66 episodes, David Addison's bickering will-they-won't-they they relationship with Sybil Shepard's Maddie again arguably created a blueprint that has been repeated in everything from Ross and Rachel to Jess and Nick. Even the format of the show was influential, routinely breaking the fourth wall in a way that now feels reasonably commonplace, but at the time felt completely new. You think this could be the Christmas episode? And while other major actors also got their start on TV, Denzel Washington on St. Elsewhere, George Clooney on ER, Rob Robin Williams on Mork and Mindy, arguably none became as big as fast as Bruce Willis after Moonlighting. In the space of five years, he'd gone from unknown extra and theater actor to one of the hottest properties in Hollywood, as well as a tabloid sensation thanks to his relationship with Demi Moore. According to journalist Julie Solomon, who covered the set of The Bonfire of the Vanities, this lightning quick rise to stardom may have gone to his head. He'd been famous for five years. But it was like he still hadn't adjusted to it. Listening to his interviews from the set of Bonfire, it's as if Willis wasn't sure how to be the ordinary everyman while also being a movie star. And he seemed to resent the machine of Hollywood. I'd like to think that I'm still enough of an ordinary person inside of me anyway. What I have become a commercial for the National Enquirer. Interestingly, this early 90s period for Willis was marked by a few high-profile failures, including Bonfire and the flop Hudson Hawk. And part of what allowed his career to get back on track seems to be letting go of this ego. Marjorie Simkin, casting director on 12 Monkeys, said he was perfectly willing to leave the entourage behind if it meant getting the part in Terry Gilliam's science fiction classic. Do you know why you're here? Because I'm a good observer and a tough mind. 
Willis's cinematic celebrity may have been cemented with action, but the more comedic side of him didn't go away when he made the transition. As plastic surgeon turned mortician Dr. Ernest Melville in Death Becomes Her, he gets to indulge this and play to the ridiculousness of the plot, a black comedy about two fading beauties vying for his affection and chasing eternal youth. Much of the comedy comes from the fact that Goldie Hawn's Helen and Meryl Streep's Madeline are both elegant, beautiful women, while Dr. Menville is kind of a dork, completely overwhelmed and unable to cope with the sexuality emanating from his two pursuers. Don't pretend you're not aware of it. What? You're a powerful, sexual being, Ernest. I am. What makes both this performance and his role as David Addison so believable is not just his comedy chops, but also his vulnerability. And it's his ability to be vulnerable that's the core of maybe his most celebrated dramatic role as Dr. Malcolm Crow in The Sixth Sense. And his wife doesn't like the person that he's become. They barely speak anymore, they're like strangers. Malcolm is living with a mistake, and his desire to atone drives his desire to understand and work with nine-year-old Cole. In contrast to his brazen action hero persona, it's a role where he needs to be afraid and confront that fear. Not just of the things that Cole is seeing, but also the fact that his relationship appears to have disintegrated and he doesn't know why. I want to be able to talk to my wife again. The way we used to talk to each other. In Pulp Fiction, Quentin Tarantino brings these two sides of Bruce together, the strength and the vulnerability, in the character of aging boxer Butch. Your days are just about over. On the one hand, he gets to be the action hero we know him to be. He saves Marcellus Wallace in the middle of his assault, and when he finds out he's killed a man in the boxing ring, he's unrepentant, trying to maintain this image of strength and machismo. Now that I know he's dead, you wanna know how I feel about it? I don't feel the least bit bad about it. But at the same time, we see the softer side of him in his relationship with Fabian. Oh, I'm sorry, sweetie. I didn't mean to worry. Everything's fine. How was your breakfast? It was good. Did you get the pancakes? The no, blueberry no, pancakes? No, no, no. Ryan Johnson pulls off a similar trick in Looper. We know the kind of character Willis's Joe was because we see Joseph Gordon-Levitt playing it. Individualistic, reckless, and self-destructive. But as the older Joe, he's completely motivated by love. He still gets to be the action hero, shooting machine guns and hunting down the movie's main antagonist, but like in Pulp Fiction, there's a sense that he's not the man he once was, and there's a real vulnerability that comes with that. These two sides of Bruce, the hard body and the soft center, aren't in conflict with each other, but instead they each work to bolster the other. His skill as an actor is knowing which side to lean into and when. With some actors, you get the sense they're always playing themselves. Bruce Willis's career is too varied for that to be true, but what is true is that his roles are often in conversation with each other. For his Emmy-winning cameo in Friends, which he apparently only did because he lost a bet. I was on Friends because I lost a bet to Matthew Perry. He is, at first, the same kind of fearsome, protective father we recognize from Die Hard or Armageddon. I usually prefer Liz's boyfriends who address me as Mr. Stevens. <laughs> Of course, of course, Mr. Stevens. Before he reveals a vulnerability that, once out, cannot be put back in. Would you hug me? <laughs> I'm a little busy here, Paul. That's exactly what my dad used to say. <laughs> B. Ruby Rich writes that in Pulp Fiction, Tarantino casts his actors as embodiments of their own past characters, rescripted, to be rewarded or punished for their past behavior. Punished for his years of on-screen machismo, Bruce Willis gets to talk baby talk. You hand me a dry towel, Miss Beautiful Tulip? Kevin Smith alluded to something similar when talking about directing Willis in buddy cop comedy Cop Out. You hire Bruce Willis to play a cop in a comedy, you are kind of playing with a John McClane archetype of sorts. You're hiring the original super cop. But Willis is an active, conscious participant in creating this self-awareness and referentiality. In that same Q&A, Kevin Smith talked about requesting Willis deliver a line in the style of David Addison, and after some initial protesting, Willis did just that. For one magnificent, glorious line, David Addison appeared. Where some actors will be praised for disappearing into their roles, Bruce Willis, the star, is often used as a narrative device to deepen our understanding and appreciation of the film. If he broke the fourth wall as David Addison, arguably, he never rebuilt it. M. Night Shyamalan may have crafted a more original role for Willis in The Sixth Sense, but in Unbreakable, we are again playing with the idea of the hard-bodied Bruce. You didn't break one bone. You don't have a scratch on you. 
While it wasn't marketed as such at the time, this was Willis's superhero movie. The train crash and the subsequent relationship that security guard David Dunn has with the frail supervillain Elijah acts as the catalyst for him discovering the truth about himself. Someone who doesn't get sick, who doesn't get hurt like the rest of us. And he probably doesn't even know it and then tentatively acting on it, as if he's seeing what the limits to his powers are, almost like we're watching him realize he's Bruce Willis. Willis undergoes a similar transformation in Wes Anderson's Moonrise Kingdom. Typically in Wes Anderson cinema, actors will modify themselves in order to fit Anderson's unique style. But with Moonrise Kingdom, the innate star power Willis brings is too much not to play with. At first, Willis's Captain Sharp is a kind of ineffectual, small-town captain who doesn't inspire a great deal of authority. You say you can't invite him back? You say that he's an orphan? I don't understand how that works. W what am I supposed to do with him? Then, as the stakes of the movie increase and the need to rescue the two child runaways becomes greater, Captain Sharp rises to the occasion, channeling the super cop Bruce Willis that was in there all along. Let's go. Stop! Nobody's going anywhere. This series of Willis characters trying to reckon with their own inner action hero also relates to age. Because more so than in some genres, age is a direct, active impediment to the action hero. It's harder to cast them as the hard body when we can see the signs of it changing and getting older. Maybe that's why Willis was always touchy when questioned about his hair loss, saying, I've seen all those little digs where they try to make you feel less of a man because you're losing your hair. I'm a man and I will kick anyone's butt who tries to tell me I'm not a man because my hair is thinning. It looks good though. A guy came up to me on the street yesterday and tried to strike a match on my head. Willis's later roles don't shy away from this, though. Getting older becomes a central tension. In contemporary franchises like The Expendables and Red, Willis, along with other aging hardbody stars of the 80s, consciously play with this idea that their age makes people perceive them as, in some way, redundant. And so they offer a challenge to that. You know, yeah, we used to be on the same team together. What's my oldest worst friend doing here? Both your names came to the top of the list. Their problem. In 2007's Die Hard 4.0, John McClane has to reckon with the fact that his enemies are now fighting a digital battleground he literally doesn't understand. Wrote one little piece of code and the world falls apart. <laughs> this is virtual terrorism. What? And so he has to evolve. No longer is he in the era of conservative individualism. He's in a 21st century defined more by collectivism, and so has to share the burden of heroism with a new generation, much like he does in Armageddon. Unlike in Armageddon, where he effectively martyrs himself, though, in Die Hard 4.0, it's clear there is still a role for the aging hard body amongst all these soft bodies. As Philippa Gates says, he may be older and not as up to date with the changing world, but he is still the muscle needed to dispose of America's most unwanted. For an actor whose influence on contemporary film and TV is so big, there's an argument that Bruce Willis has always been a little underrated in terms of what he can do on the screen. While his box office has always been strong, his awards shelf is surprisingly bare, both in terms of wins and nominations. He has only two Emmys to his name, one for Moonlighting and the other for the guest spot in Friends. I can't believe you're trying to stifle me when just... 14 hours ago, we figured out that that is exactly what my mother was trying to do to me. It's often said that comedy is a genre that gets overlooked during awards season, but it's more accurate to say that genre cinema in general is cast aside, seen as less worthy of critical adoration than more straight dramatic films, and maybe Willis was a victim of that. But you don't have to scratch far below the surface of Bruce Willis's work to see that there's more depth there than it might first seem. Give this job to my friend here. He loves playing in the jungle, right? That's right. It's a shame that this isn't always appreciated, not just because now we know he'll never film another movie, but also because his movies that are yet to come out were made when maybe he shouldn't have been working at all. Sources told the LA Times Willis struggled with his memory and was fed lines through an earpiece. Information suggests that his box office draw was still so valuable that he may have been exploited, making 22 films in four years despite struggles with mental acuity and sometimes not understanding his lines or why he was on set. Looking back at his body of work now, hopefully there will be a reappraisal and an understanding of the value that an action hero or any genre actor can contribute to film and culture. Genre cinema often speaks to so much more than what's on the screen. It speaks to what's happening in wider culture and can articulate that to a broader audience without sacrificing things like spectacle, entertainment value, or humor. Things that Willis did may be better than anyone else. TV dinner feels like. 
This is the take on your favorite movie, shows, and pop culture. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.